Okay, this video is gonna be about traumatic brain injury. We're just gonna hit on a couple key points. It's a big subject, so the most interesting thing, most important thing for our purposes will be mild traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is abbreviated TBI. There's lots of stuff about severe TBI. You'll see that that's very easy to find about tra traumatic subarachnoids, subdurals, epidurals, and parenchymals. That stuff's actually more straightforward than the mild. Um, cerebral contusions, often hemorrhagic, diffuse axonal injury. I think that's interesting whereby you can get a acceleration, deceleration injury. Um, and then you wonder if a milder form of that can happen with mild T TBI. With rotation, that's if the person's head twists at the time of the trauma. And I've had friends that are boxers tell me that you hit somebody right on the chin and the spinning of the head generates a lot of torque and it's more likely to knock the person out. So it's a more severe brain injury. Um, Multiple mild traumatic brain injuries can lead to CTE, that's chronic traumatic encephalopathy. As far as what causes it, you know, there's obvious sports like boxing. Muhammad Ali is a classic example. Uh, football players. Football players, there's been a lot of information in the news the last couple of years about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. A lot of football players become demented at a young age, like the great Chicago Bears quarterback, uh, Jim McMahon, who was a brilliant quarterback, and then he's demented in his late 40s. It's pretty sad. Um, and pro football players die much earlier than expected, you know, because a lot of their head trauma and other in injuries or comorbidities. Uh, rugby has a lot of head trauma, but the one that people don't tend to know about is soccer. Um, I've seen really sad situations from soccer. I've seen kids that were star soccer players have to drop out of college due to brain injury. There's papers about MRI injuries. You know, think about soccer, how crazy that is hitting a ball with your head. You know, the coach will kick the ball from the corner and people volunteer to hit it with their heads, like volunteering to be punched in the head. It's very stupid. They should change the rule, not allowed to hit the ball with your head. Or my advice would be don't let your kid play soccer. Um, and old people, they get a lot of falls and they'll have injuries, uh, intracranial injuries from that. Okay, for mild traumatic uh, brain injury, often abbreviated lowercase m, TBI, when you do a brain MRI, it's, it's almost always normal. You might see some hyperintensities on the flare sequence without hemorrhage. Rare to see something uh, positive on susceptibility weighted image, SWI. Uh, but they can have significant cognitive impairment with a normal brain MRI. Uh, mild TBI will have a tendency to inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. That's an important enzyme that facilitates when pyruvate goes from the cytoplasm with glycolysis into Krebs cycle inside the mitochondria. And so that's gonna decrease energy production. And the basic point of all this is that the patient's usually more severely injured than is widely recognized. And they're gonna need more time off, more time to heal. Um, there's something called a step back approach whereby with patients with mild TBI, as they undergo rehab, let's say returning to competition or whatnot, that they have a whole bunch of small steps and they can always step back when they feel they're not ready for the next one in line. That gives them more options rather than suddenly having to return to a rather intense activity which they're not ready for. The rehabilitation is a marathon, it's not a sprint, and so it should be a gradual process of trying to keep on improving back to baseline. The Jill Bolt Taylor recovery from stroke I think is good, even though it's a different situation, stroke than traumatic brain injury, there's some parallels and she, you know, rehabbed for eight years and came back from a stroke. We talked about her in a previous lecture. She's got a very popular uh, TED Talk video about her stroke of insight to recover from. Um, Clark Elliott is a guy who, he's an artificial intelligence researcher. Here's his book. I just read it. Um, pretty book. Kind of a strange book. And I don't know for sure if he's over-exaggerating the benefit of his, his helpers because I haven't studied him enough. But... He's an intelligent guy, knows a lot about the brain, writing about his own recovery from traumatic brain injury. So that helps a person sometimes is to realize others have gone through it before. And he's rather articulate at expressing all the defects he suffered with his traumatic brain injury and then how he recovered from it and made a virtually full recovery according to his book. You know, just in brief, when the brain goes back and forth, acceleration, deceleration, the bottom of the brain here, the inferior frontal lobe, can rub against the skull and get a contusion from that. The temporal lobes stick out like this. It's kind of like looking at a fist, and that would be the temporal lobe, and that also will rub against the skull with an acceleration, deceleration injury, and that can cause a brain contusion like a bruise on the brain.
Okay, this is from my previous lecture about Rogers theory of dementia. And the reason why I think this is actually an important slide is you would be amazed. Doctors, most you know, typical allopathic doctors, they really don't have any training in nutrition and they start talking about nutrition and they don't know what they talk about and what they're talking about. Plus, the models of traumatic brain injury for clinical medicine are, in my opinion, kind of stupid. And I say that because you know, if you talk about other parts of the body, you know, a general surgeon usually knows a lot more about wound healing. You need to have good blood supply to the wound. You need to have good glucose delivery to the wound. So anything that causes diabetes like insulin resistance is bad or sleep apnea. Those things are bad. Well, you help prevent those by optimizing the diet. Sodium is a vasoconstrictor, so you don't want sodium because you need to get blood to the brain. You don't want dietary fat because it drops oxygen delivery to the brain. Um, you want those plant foods with the uh, potassium and the magnesium because those are vasodilators. That'll get more blood to the brain. These names here are just authors who've written books on these subjects. You don't want anything that makes you like a mouse equivalent of deletorious cognitive impairment theory. So that's an important point. That should be the question asked. How can we make sure you're getting adequate oxygen and glucose to your brain? All right. Antioxidants come from plant foods. Those also help to protect against the processes that lead to apoptosis, you know, programmed cell death of neurodegeneration and loss of neurons. You should avoid stimulants. You're going to be increasing the metabolic demand of that neuron. You crank up that metabolic demand of that neuron, the same amount of oxygen and glucose delivery is not going to be as able to maintain its energy needs and it might be more likely to go into apoptosis, program cell death. Avoid all toxins. Metabolic toxins are things that decrease the ability of that cell to produce energy or, for example, things that increase uh, the risk of mitochondrial injury. So you want to avoid all oils. Uh, sat fat will make increased blood brain barrier permeability potentially. The brain neurons can't metabolize it effectively, so you want to minimize your intake of that. These are just some other uh, inhibitors, if you will, of energy production by the cell. They're all bad. And so these things should be considered, whereas you'll virtually never hear anything about any of those things in conventional medical lectures, which is, in my opinion, quite ignorant. Okay, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. This is the, the one that was most popularized with regard to all the football players. Uh, many of them have donated their brains for research. This lady here, Anne McKee, became quite famous for developing a staging system of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And it's good that she's described the disease. It's good that she confirmed that it exists. That helps some of these unfortunate football players, pro football players, that their families get some compensation after they die. Okay, so that's all well and good, but again, you got to remember, she's looking at autopsies of brains. It would be nice to help, be able to help these patients more while they're still alive, and that's what I was just talking about with that previous slide. Make sure you got good oxygen and glucose delivery to the brain. Avoid all these things that inhibit energy production or that ramp up metabolic demand in the neurons. And I said this in a previous lecture, what I've seen a lot of these so-called experts saying things that I think are idiotic recommending fish. Fish is notorious for being high in mercury, which is a brain poison. It will impair cognitive function. Recommending olive oil. How idiotic is that? All oils are going to be bad for the brain. They're going to cause problems like insulin resistance. It contains sat fat as well. It has PUFAs in it. They're going to increase the risk of lipid peroxidation. That is, in my opinion, a really bad idea. Mediterranean diet also will include bread, Typically, breads are going to have MSG, a brain stimulant. Um, typically, they're going to have oils in them. Wine, alcohol is a neurotoxic to the brain. Cheese has got casomorphines in it. And it's also, you know, same as dairy and meat, inflammatory, acidic, a lot of bad things about it. The herbicides in non-organic food are toxic. I've talked about that in my previous lecture on herbicides and health. They should be avoided as much as possible. When you avoid meat, you avoid a lot of inflammation which makes life easier for the brain. Avoiding these processed foods like with high fructose uh, corn syrup. Some of those in the past would have mercury in them, but there's other problems with it too. We talked about these stimulants being a problem. And now, by the way, you know, I'm a neuroradiologist. I, that's the main thing I do. I'm also, I've also been trained in interventional radiology, general radiology, et cetera. I did a surgical internship, et cetera. But a couple of just basic points. So I don't routinely take care of TBI patients. I read their brain MRIs all the time, but I'm not the one consulting them on a daily basis, just so you're aware of that. A lot of what I'm talking about are things to me that just seem like common sense for helping these patients because there are tons of them. And a lot of what I've read, you know, for example, in Clark's book here, 
he goes to the different doctors and they're all just telling him, no, nope, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. You know, brain cells don't come back. You know, you just got to learn to live with it. Okay. And so there's things a person can do a little bit. And he talks about some of the rehab methods. So basically the way metabolism works, glucose comes into the cell. It's phosphorylated, so it can't get out so easily. It runs through glycolysis. Pyruvate then goes into the mitochondria. And this is used to make ATP. Inside the mitochondria, there's an outer mitochondrial membrane, an inner mitochondrial membrane. There's complex 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Complex 1, 3, and 4 pump out protons to build up a gradient in the intramembranous space. That gradient is harvested by complex 5, which is ATP synthase. And when that proton comes back in under pressure, so to speak, the energy of that is used to make ATP. And that's how most of the ATP in the body is generated. So that's a real important thing for making energy. You need energy for everything a cell does. Okay, so one of the problems is if this starts backing up due to high fat diet is a real typical, most common example, electrons get dropped off. They don't make it all the way to ATP synthase or all the way to oxygen. And when they get dropped off, they can combine with oxygen inside the mitochondria, produce superoxides, and there's ways to quell that, of course, but sometimes, especially if a person is chronically iron overloaded for meat and meat, for example, they can undergo the Fenton reaction, produce hydroxyl radicals, and those can trash mitochondrial membranes or lipid peroxidation. So this is my point. You don't want extra iron on board because it will predispose to oxidative stress. You don't want high dietary fat, which predisposes to reversing electron transport in cells and causing diabetic physiology. This is just an example of some of the other things that will inhibit electron transport in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So these things add up. It's like um, there'll be 10 different little minor things. And so that's why you want to optimize whatever you can control to get good, um, good oxygen and glucose delivery in the brain. So some other observations I've had over the years is I think bird watching, you know, I realize a lot of people, it's just not an option to go bird watching. But if it is an option, it's one of the best things a person can do. You go bird watching with another person. It's a fun, enjoyable way to have conversations, spend a day or a couple hours out in nature. Um, if you have an older or more knowledgeable person, they can be a really helpful guide. It's very enjoyable. There's something called biophilia. We enjoy nature. It's a low stress environment. There's no real competition. You have your binoculars, you identify the birds, you notice their songs, you notice their wing patterns, their behavior, and it leads to very pleasant conversations. This is a pretty well-known thing by people that really like biology. You know, James Watson, the co-discoverer of the triple helix of DNA structure, that's how he learned biology, by going for bird walks with his father. I can tell you, I used to, when I was at Stanford, I used to love going for bird walks with some of my other biology student friends, and we had some older mentor guys that would take us out and we'd go into these nature places and stuff and go to the uh, state parks and stuff. And we really enjoyed it, and it was a good way to learn a lot of biology in a practical way. There's no stress. There's no competition. It's just pleasant and enjoyable. You're getting exercise, which is good for the brain. You're getting sunshine. That's good for the brain. You're in a pleasant social environment. That's good for the brain. All of those things are very uh, positive, and I liked them. And it's more sort of a normal human thing to do. Okay, of course, you got to get a lot of sleep. Jill Bolt Taylor would sleep in, you know, 14, 16 hours a day sometimes at her mother's house. And especially early on, you need more sleep. That's when the neurons clean themselves, clean out all the cellular, cellular debris from the injury out of the extracellular matrix around the cells. When a person's able to, they can start reading again to build up their verbal skills. Um, just watch videos or read on the Internet about other persons who've improved their brain function, recovered from brain injuries, or books like, you know, Power Foods by... Bernard, good book about, you know, the effect of diet on brain health. So in general, brain health is pretty similar across the different conditions. You need good glucose and oxygen delivery. Um, incremental improvement, you just a tiny bit each day, that adds up. And it's going to take, it could take years before they feel close to their old self if they ever get back to that point. But just making progress makes a person happy. Uh, Walking is a great exercise. And they have to figure out how intense or stressful an exercise they can undergo. I would avoid lifting heavy weights, especially early on, probably avoid lifting weights altogether early on because I'd worry about that increasing into cranial pressure. Um, later on, it'll depend on how the recovery is going. Um, 
Walking also gets the lymphatic fluid flowing, and that helps a person to be healthy, cleans out the extracellular matrix. Okay, being in a safe environment, a loving environment, like Jill Bull Taylor. She went home to live with her mother for eight years she did rehab. And that feeling safe and belonging and feeling loved, that lowers a person's stress level, lowers their cortisol so they can heal better. Okay, if you can't, don't have any, you know, forest or woods or a nice place like that, you just go to the zoo. It's very pleasant to walk around in the zoo. And you can bring binoculars to the zoo. They'll usually have some type of nature enclosure where there's tropical birds running around and it can be pleasant. You'll see some of the other animals better if you have binoculars. Um, it'll lead to more interesting conversations about animal behavior. Um, if a hobby is good, a pet's good, whatever seems to make a person happy. It's real important for people to have some type of purpose, you know, something that motivates them to get out of bed in the morning. Okay. Um, talked about audiobooks gradually ramping up their skills. Growth mindset of Carol Dweck. She's a psychologist out of Stanford that basically an awareness that effort yields to results makes a person happy and more motivated to try to develop their cognitive skills. They can, if necessary, review study skills. We talked about the benefit of the low-fat vegan diet to optimize blood and Blood flow for oxygen and glucose delivered to the brain and to avoid inflammation. Okay, so here's just a normal synapse. Let's say a serotonin synapse from the amino acid precursor, tryptophan. Serotonin's made. Serotonin then goes into a vesicle. It's released at the presynaptic membrane. The vesicle merges with the plasma membrane of the presynaptic neuron. The vesicles, the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft between the neurons. Postsynaptic neuron has a receptor on its plasma membrane. Then the synaptic cleft serotonin is recycled. It's taken back up into the presynaptic neuron. That's just a sense of what a, a basic neuron does. Pretty basic stuff. And then as far as nutrition... Two-thirds of the nutrition in a neuron is going for this potassium sodium ATPase pump because it forms like a plasma membrane gradient, the battery of energy for the cell, and it generates this resting membrane potential, potential of about negative 65 millivolts. And the way this gets screwed up is normally we're designed to eat, you know, in the ballpark 10 to 15 times as much potassium as sodium. And so when a person starts eating these processed food diets where they're eating far more sodium than potassium, they start to accumulate um, sodium inside the cell and that messes up this gradient and then they become less able to pump out calcium. Calcium that's a big deal. Calcium's like a light switch in a cell. And when they can't pump out the calcium, I'm sorry, then you get calcium accumulating, let's say in the postsynaptic neuron here, and that'll cause this postsynaptic neuron to fire increased action potentials and that leads to increased metabolic um, demand, which can then, if a neuron can't meet its metabolic demand, it can go in apoptosis and die. So you don't want that. So high sodium is bad. So anyways, um, other things helpful is simplify your life. You know, if you read about a lot of really highly productive people, they have a real simple life. It just helps them. For example, I'll wear the same t-shirt every day, the same pattern of underwear socks every day that way I can quickly get dressed get dressed there's no thinking about a choice it's always the same thing why not it doesn't matter and it frees up your mind for other things um, here's a quote by William James a famous psychologist physician he said the more of our daily life we can hand over to automatism you know get a machine or other person to do that busy work the more the higher powers of our mind are set free to do their own proper work so to speak so you free up your brain for other things by not wasting mental energy on the simple things. So anyways, hopefully that was helpful, uh, sort of a summary overview of a traumatic brain injury.